Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have uh, Indu Navar. She's the CEO of Everything ALS, and ALS is uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, a condition with that we're going to discuss. So, Indu, thanks for coming. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah, if you're okay to talk about it, can you explain why you're personally interested in ALS and, and what happened to uh, your family in regards to it? Yes. You know, ALS is only thing I knew before, you know, entering into forming everything ALS was because the ice bucket challenge and everybody knew about, you know, it was more like a fun event, right? And I'm a tech entrepreneur. I've built software companies. And uh, also I was on the founding team of what is now WebMD, but you know, never knew anything about chronic disease. Life was good. My husband was at Amazon. He was an inventor of Amazon Cloud and many other innovations. And we did an early retirement and we were investing in uh, advising in tech startups to solve a lot of the problems in technology. And he's got a big footprint. And so, so have I in what the tech revolution has been in the last 20 years. And uh, he was uh, 49 and he started having, you know, kind of what looked like an ankle issue, like, you know, oh, you know, I have some issues like walking. And we went to neurologists very, very early. And what we heard was, you know, it could be as simple as a virus that will go away and heal, or it could be fatal disease, like you're going to die in two to five years. We don't know what it is. Just let's wait and see how bad it gets. Anyway, so fast forward, it took about two, two years to get diagnosed he was diagnosed with uh, ALS and he passed away in August of 2019. So since oh, then, no. you know, what I realized is we really don't know that this exists and also how little penetration has happened in everything we have done in the last 20 years in the technology world uh, into the disease, especially neurological diseases about 50 years behind even cancer in getting diagnosed, there's no technology, there's no innovation that's happened in the last 70 years, uh, which was shocking. And after he passed away, I promised myself that I'll continue to work on it because I do not want my husband, who is the love of my life, to be just a number in this disease. He's going to be the you know, force that changed the phase of this disease. And I want him, I want his suffering to have meaning. I want his uh, life to have meaning, even if he's not here. Yeah, that's a really nice thing that you're doing for uh, him and for other sufferers of it. Who are some uh, famous people? Did Stephen Hawking have this? Just for context for the audience, are there any like super famous people that have had it? Yeah, it's Stephen Hawking's. And if there are, uh, you know, Many of the sports players, people would know, you know, um, Steve Gleason, he's got, you know, ALS and 
many other football players and uh, baseball players have had it. And also, you know, many of the actor and actresses have passed away from this, but uh, Sam Shepard had it. Uh, but the problem is because by the time you get diagnosed, it's so late and you, you know, you don't have much time after that. We never hear about it. You know, people pass away and, you know, even Hal, who is the first engineer of Bitcoin, right? And today everybody knows what crypto is. If you go look at Hal, he was kind of, they say that, you know, he was the inventor and he was the first engineer. He died. Oh, really? How many many died of this? Yeah. And, you know, the thing is, we, we just don't hear about these things because, like I said, you know, by the time you get diagnosed, you're just like, holy cow, what just happened? And then people pass away and the families are devastated and they move on. Well, what, what happens in this disease? What does it do and how does it work? So it's a, it's a really gruesome, you know, to have ALS in a way that it's a motor neuron disease that is the motor neuron that is uh, any motor neuron is part of the brain that controls all of the movement and, you know, uh, voluntary or involuntary. And um, it starts uh, getting affected. What I mean is that the nerves, the motor neurons start dying. So when it starts dying, the muscles start deteriorating. So the muscles don't have the, you know, electricity or the food, you know, that's what muscles need is the nerves to really conduct. And then the muscles start atrophying. So so people start uh, losing their uh, muscles in their legs, their hands, and, you know, their their voice, they start losing their vocal cord. And then in the end, they start like uh, losing the muscles in their chest. And w- when that happens, you can't really breathe out or breathe in. So it's really, you know, disease of suffocation. Uh, one of our colleagues who worked with us, who's 36 year old, who's got ALS, he said it seems like he's being swallowed by a python. Because, you know, he, the worst thing is your brain isn't intact. You can actually think, see everything, but you, you can't do anything else. So that's the worst part of this disease is that you can actually see everything, think and move. But, you know, it's just like you, you feel like you're swallowed by a python. Yeah, that's horrible. At what age is the typical onset? It sounds like Stephen Hawking got it very young in his 20s, but your husband got it much later, you know, 49. Is there a typical onset age? Um, you know, we've had recently an 18 year old who passed away from ALS. I think the youngest we have today who is diagnosed with ALS is an eight year old. And I don't know if it's happening sooner and sooner or not. I mean, there is a 26 year old uh, female who got diagnosed and she started her group called Her Story because, you know, it was so hard to her to get diagnosed because people thought that, you know, the neurologist like, oh, you know, I think you might have depression or your anxiety. And she's like, no, this is not anxiousness. I'm really, you know, losing these functions. And, you know, when they got, uh, when she got diagnosed with ALS, because ALS is that gets diagnosed with elimination. That is, they do all kinds of tests. And then after two years, they say, okay, you have ALS because we don't see that you have anything else. So sometimes, you know, people pass away by by the time you get ALS. And she formed this group called Her Story. And she wanted to see how many more females like her age, below 35. And she's got over 30 people with not much effort that she's found. And she's got a website called, you know, uh, and she's got an organization about females her age. Um, so it's definitely not a old people disease. It's not, you know, it's it's really happening for people, you know, in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Okay. Well, what is understood about it? How does it happen? You know, how is it treatable? Very little is understood about it. I mean, you know, there is 10% of the people who get it. They say that it's a genetic component, but rest of them is sporadic. That is, you can get it, I can get it, anybody, my neighbors can get it who've never heard of ALA. So it's sporadic means we've never heard of it. Nobody in our family has had it. And we really don't know much about how we get it or what causes it. So that is why we need to have more effort into research. And that is why what we are doing is that we call it citizen research. That is the families who've lost to somebody to ALS. And if they have ALS, somebody going through, we all get together and we do research so we can distribute large sums of data to the researchers because the researchers would benefit from the advocacy group like ours who's active in research 
who are going to be collecting the data and do open innovation. That is, we invite, we do challenges, we invite people, large you know, group of people to come in and take a look at the data to see if there is something we can find. It's definitely, you know, not understood just because, you know, there's not a lot of concrete effort that has been put together or funding that's put together to do something like that. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click on support us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. Well, how long uh, between first onset of symptoms and someone passing away on average? What's the length of it? On average, from the first symptom to passing away is two to five years. And it takes about 18 months to two years from the time you get uh, onset to get diagnosed. So you can do the math. Many people actually pass away before they get diagnosed. Well, how do people get diagnosed? What kind of tests do they do to make sure that it's happening to them? So it's called a method of elimination. So that means when you go to the office, doctor's office, they'll do all kinds of tests like, you know, MRI to see if it's a brain tumor, it's other, you know, uh, diseases. And if it's, it's called method of elimination, that is, you know, it's not brain tumor, it's not this, it's not that, then they say, okay, it's an ALS. So I mean, I was praying so many times it would be a brain tumor for my husband and it's not ALS. Just because if it's brain tumor, at least we can do something about it and not ALS. That's how scary it is. But again, how is it diagnosed if there's no way to diagnose it? Well, there's no biomarkers, there's no... What about muscle testing? Uh, Yeah, even if you do muscle testing, again, remember, once you have a lot of motor neuron dead, then that's when you get like, okay, you know, this looks like ALS because you can do muscle tests and say you have lost two limbs, two upper motor neuron and two lower motor neuron. Yes, you get diagnosed when you 80% of your motor neurons are dead. Yeah, that's odd. What, does it start in a particular tissue or does it seem to randomly start in different spots in different people? Yeah, today there are three different types uh, where people can start. That is bulbar means you start with speech and limb means you start either in your leg or your hands. And then you can start in axial. That means it, it affects your breathing, number one. So you can start in any, any, of, those, any of those places. And what's the progression of those three different places? Is it the same or are some slower than others or not as bad? It's again, you know, they say that not really very concretely proven. If it's limb onset, it's a little bit slower than if it's actually breathing or a bulbar. That is the speech because it's both of them are very close to you know, affecting the breath or the lungs. Well, as it progresses, does it go along the same path or does it seem to just move all over the place and there's no rhyme or reason? All over the places. Um, yeah, it's it's really hard to, if, if it's limb, they say that, you know, it, it usually goes to first limb, second limb, and then it hits the speech and then the breathing or breathing and speech. So you might get some, you know, and and there are some people who've started in their leg or fingers and within one year they're dead, right? So it's very hard to say. Has has anyone done, um, you know, autopsies and histology and people that have passed Mm -hmm. to be able to find out correlations? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the thing that we have is that, like I said, there's not a systematic way of collecting postmortem tissue, or even doing genetic testing, simple thing like, you know, okay, you got diagnosed with ALS, let's do a whole genome sequencing for you and your family. Insurance doesn't cover it. So nobody does the genetic testing. And um, today, this morning, I was talking to one of the family practice physician who works with me, and her husband has got ALS. She said, uh, she was shocked that, you know, this one family came in, and they told the physician, I want to get the whole genome sequenced. And the physician said, why? What are you going to do about it anyway? So that's a a real asshole response, but I understand. If you like this podcast, 
please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. This has become like we do not have a way to, you know, systematic way. There is no standard of care. And I, I remember when my husband, when he was going through it, we found this genetic marker, which looked like leukemia. So we thought, oh, my God, this could be leukemia, which acts like it's, you know, ne- motor neuron death, because we don't know what ALS is anyway. So when we talked to the hematologists, they said, yes, it could be. And, you know, we went to the Johns Hopkins hematologists. They was such, even though they don't know, such a standard of care. It, it was like they all got together. They had a concise plan. They said, we'll do this. Okay, you're going to be in Seattle. Like, you know, let's get you in front of this. But in ALS, there is nothing. You know, it, it's just like day and night when we looked at the Cancer Institute and uh, Neurology ALS Institute. It was just like, you know, whatever a neurologist feels like that is right from their point of view is what they practice. Well, it's, are there any particular doctors or specialties that can address this? You know, like a rheumatologist or like who would be the closest type of doctor that would have any insight into this? Well, we do have a neurologist who actually focuses on ALS. I mean, there are neurologists who focus on neurodegenerative diseases. Okay, so what, what research has been done? What is known about ALS? Uh, What is known about ALS is that there are two genes, SOD1 and C9, um, that those are genes carried by less than 10% of the ALS population, and the rest of them we don't know. And we are still, you know, in our path of finding what what it might be. Again, the problem is we don't have enough data because people pass away so early, and it's really hard to keep them in the clinical trials because, you know, we, we just um, lose them and the clinical trials take long. And I think I would say the, the real issue is we don't have any biomarkers. So what we are focusing on is bringing digital biomarkers. So we are able to, you know, measure speech, facial changes, gross motor, that is how do people walk, move their legs and their hands and their breathing, all those digitized and we use AI and machine learning to figure out the progression tracking and hopefully we'll come up with diagnostics as well. Well, is, so there's no one looking at the microbiome of these people? There's no one drawing their blood? There's no one doing anything? Or like we, what, we, what research is being done? Well, there are research that's been done, but it's, there is no concrete markers that we are able to find from, from what we know. Oh, so cohorts of people with ALS have had their blood drawn They've yes. done full full oh, metabolic yeah. panels. A lot of blood, yes. Other I mean, panels, and they see nothing. They see nothing. Because really, ALS is a multivariant disease. I mean, it might be there are many, many diseases in this ALS, what we put as an ALS. But until we start thinking about subtyping and understanding what are the different types, it's it's really hard because, you know, there is something called neurofilament. That is, you can look at neurofilament in your blood, you know, but also that's not, that's one time. It doesn't say how you're progressing or whether you have it or not. What if you had neurofilament? So it's, it's a very borderline. Nothing is concrete about, okay, if you have this, this is what it is from the things that we know. Again, not, you know, doesn't mean that we're not going to find it, but, but we do need to put effort into uh, funding it and researching it in a way to find solution for it. And, uh, and and the big thing is that we need to have advocacy, citizen research, like patients really getting involved and families who've lost to somebody to ALS being involved to drive this forward. The issue that we have is it's like a revolving door because people pass away so early and it is a really a devastating disease when you see a loved one just disappear like that the families get devastated and they move on. And I believe that the, the only way we're going to solve this is the people with, you know, families who've lost to ALS and or who are living with ALS and who have to get involved in research advocacy like ours. That's why we are doing it because we've lost someone to ALS and we all have gotten together to say, we need to see this through and because we understand a lot about what happened and we we need to be driving it because by the time neurologists really see the patients you know they're seeing them where they've lost 50 to 80 percent of the motor neuron our motor neurons do they have a lot of redundancy in certain parts of the body and could a biopsy be done and histology to look at them and to see what their condition is not really um because 
that means we have to biopsy the brain, right? I mean, what people are doing now is IPS cells. That is, you take the cells and you grow motor neuron in the dish. And of course, that does not have epigenetics. That is all the environmental factor that can happen in the cells. So you, what you do is you take your cells and then you do motor neuron. You grow it into motor neuron. It's an embryonic motor neuron. That means when you were born, right? So it doesn't have any epigenetics. But you know, from that, you, we are trying to find out what we can get through there. But that's one of the angles, you know, Answer ALS, that's another organization I'm part of, we are doing in there. But everything ALS, we focused on more digital biomarkers. That is, we we look at uh, early, early symptoms of, uh, you know, speech changes, changes in walking and changes in typing, you know, fine motors, how you use your fingers. So we can actually track through AI and machine learning the progression. Yeah, I understand. How, how does anyone know where the problem is? I mean, you have, you know, the motor neurons in the brain, but then you have the nerves that go all the way down we you know, don't to know. the appendage. We like, don't you know. know. Well, you, well, yeah, if it's, in a, if it's in a limb, does anyone even know where the problem is? is, it, is Richard, it the if, original... we, if we knew, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Believe yeah. me, it's really that backwards. You would be shocked. Well, I was so <clears> shocked the same way when I found out. And we were doing clinical trials. And I say, so we're doing clinical trials. How do we know that he's getting better? And they're like, I don't know. We don't know. Well, is there another neurodegenerative disease that's very similar to it where there has been more research and anything be I th- I think, understood from there? I think SMA is one disease that is motor neuron disease, but it's uh, it affects children. There's a lot more work that's gone in, but it is one gene. So it's a single gene uh, mutation. So they've been able to do a gene therapy for it and come up with a solution for it. But ALS is a multivariant gene, so it's it's uh, it's not the same. It doesn't fit in that category. But the other uh, example is probably Parkinson's has done a lot better job with coming up with, you know, there's still a lot of work needs to be done in Parkinson's, but uh, they've come up with, you know, deep brain stimulator that helps in a lot of condition, a lot of people in Parkinson's. So I think I think that again they they have the benefit of people living longer with Parkinson's who can actually you know affect the change in ALS because people pass away that doesn't mean that the incident rate is low but people living with the condition is low so there is you know people go well where is the math you know how much money would I make to fix this problem because if people pass away who's going to pay like it becomes more you know revenue generating conversation about who would actually put the money in to actually fix it. I don't know. It just seems like, uh, I guess, in order to understand what's going on, there has to be some basic research done. What, how many people in the U.S. or the worldwide get ALS? How many people, one in 300 have, you know, one in 300 have a chance of getting ALS. So incident rate is one in 10,000 people in the United States. At any one time, there are about 40, 30 to 40,000 people in U.S. are living with ALS, but about 6,000 people get diagnosed every year and about 6,000 people pass away every year. And worldwide, there is about 450,000 to 500,000 living with ALS. I don't know. What, in, in terms of the research, do you think it's better to, to simply characterize that someone has it? Or is it better to look for, again, an origin of it? Like, like when you were talking about maybe having a genetic basis, why would someone then get it at 10 versus 20, 30, 40, or 50? You know, it sounds like that would be a, a maybe an epigenetic change that maybe had gotten locked in and maybe that, you know, in concert with the gene being altered, maybe then that's what causes it. But if it's, you know, if it has a genetic basis, why wouldn't it happen at birth? Why would it, quote unquote, wait for decades in some cases? Well, the mutation happens at a different rate. So just because you have the gene doesn't mean you're going to get the disease then. It needs to mutate and have that condition show up. And might be there is another gene that gets, you know, there's a methylation gene that gets turned on and then that will affect the, because you're a carrier of this gene. So it, it is, it's not a one shot, like you have a gene, so you're going to get it. So it's it's a lot more. All right, but that's what I mean. Maybe there's, you know, it. it or some people must be sequenced, but can they do epigenetic sequencing? It sounds like this would be maybe we do uh, need to do epigenetics would turn it on. Well, we need to do whole genome sequencing. It's not just epigenetic. So we need to do whole genome sequencing for every ALS patient. And that's when we're going to find out. But the problem is we're not even collecting basic data 
when people get diagnosed with ALS? Maybe the easiest thing to do to avoid ethics problems and everything, unfortunately, is to, you know, deal with families with a person's recently passed and then ask for tissue samples and other stuff. Or when they're, you know, right near the end, maybe they would be more amenable because at least they can help someone else. We had a, we, we have researchers coming in and talking and everything ALS every two weeks. If you go to everythingals.org slash videos, you can see all the videos. So um, the recent one, or go to our YouTube channel, we have 58, 60 hours of content from all the researchers who talk, who are doing ALS research. So one of the recent researchers is from NIH, and he asked about, you know, postmortem tissue. And, you know, most of, the, I think we had about 250 people in our audience live they all were like, you know, I'm going to give give you my tissue. Please use my tissue to figure it out. So there is no lack of enthusiasm from patients. There's no lack of patients want to get involved. Pa- patients want to be involved, but it's funding. It's people are not, the insurance doesn't fund the whole genome sequencing for these patients. We, we're not really studying it the way we should be studying it. So when when people get diagnosed with ALS, there should be a systematic way to go ahead and say, okay, I need to collect your whole genome sequencing, your sibling's whole genome sequencing, or your family, if if they want to participate. There's nothing like that. So when when my husband got diagnosed, I was shocked. They said, oh, insurance might not even cover your, if you have C9 or SOD1. I'm like, why not? And uh, anyway, so... We got that done and we had to pay $10,000 out of pocket to get the old genome sequenced. And, you know, how many people actually will go spend $10,000 to get whole genome sequenced? And uh, for what, right? I mean, like, okay, I don't know what, what happens after that, but we had data science we hired and we, you know, we're entrepreneurs. So we got a gene, we hired our own, you know, analysis. We wanted to know the analysis. So we have not really streamlined this process of collecting the data that we need to really get to the bottom of it. If we don't have data, we'll be circling back with, okay, I've studied 25 people, 30 people. We're not going to find anything with 25 or 30 people. There's a cancer researcher that I've spoken to named Azra Raza. She's in Pakistan. Over the decades, she's been collecting tens of thousands of tissue samples from her patients that have, uh, you know, before they've passed. She hasn't had the money to really go through all the tissue samples and do everything she needs to do. But for you guys, that may be an intermediate step. Maybe what you do for lack of funding is you collect the postmortem tissue, for, you know, keep it on deep freeze. And over the next maybe five years, you build up enough of them. And maybe now funding comes in and the samples are already there. And maybe that's the way you could there, kind there of is, act there, your way in. You know? that, that's, that's already being done. So. Oh, there are samples being collected and, you know, because there are institutions where somebody wants to give their tissue, then I think their funeral costs are covered. I mean, so there are programs that is uh, collecting all the blood and tissue. But the problem is we're not going to find out anything by just keeping them and keeping them in the freezer. All right. There needs to be funding to study it and analyze it. But, you know, perhaps that's um, yeah, maybe that's the way to go. So do you think it'll be years before anyone amasses enough where they could do a study or is there enough right now? There's just no money to study it. There is enough right now. I mean, that you know, like I said, there's enough data that we can collect to study it. So it's not lack of participation or enough people donating, wanting to donate the data, but we have to make a systematic way of collecting it and analyzing it and having gotcha. qualified people put together. And uh, we are about 50 years behind cancer. Yeah, that's and, crazy. And and if you see neurology, one in four people will have issues with neurology by 2030. This is a big problem. This is this is not going to go away. This is going to be a bigger problem. Now with post-COVID, we're going to have even more neurology issues. So we do need to hurry up and get get more funding and get more focus and get more hands on, you know, uh, on the deck here to really study this and put effort into solving it. What do you think should be some of the, you know, if there was money available, what, what should be the first, you know, one or two things that needs to be studied? I think a couple of things where I would put my money into getting everybody whole genome sequenced, everybody who wants to participate, that whole genome sequence cannot be locked. So today what happens is somebody gets an NIH grant and they want to study whole genome sequencing from their families and get what? They don't give the data to anybody else. 
it gets locked. And they say, oh, it's my IRB. I can't give it to you. And, and open innovation is a must. I mean, I think it's unethical for people to actually collect patients' data of what they're suffering and not able to actually share it with everybody else. So it needs to be open. It needs to be open innovation. So we need to get everybody who wants to participate, whole genome sequence. And we did Kaggle competition. You know, we, we put together Kaggle competition from 115 uh, genome sequenced uh, and transcriptomics we have from Answer ALS, which we thought very, very small amount. But, you know, these entrepreneurs came in. We have 30,000 people who worked on it. 600 people actually, you know, coded it and 50 people submitted the results. And we had some massive, massive thinking and brainstorming around these ideas that nobody thought autophagy gene could be, you know, implicated. And even, you know, some of the very well-known researchers didn't know. So, there is a lot we can do from bringing in the community and opening it up just like we did open source and software. And, you know, that's a way to solve any of these complex diseases is to really open it up to the community. And, and the second is what I'm working on, digital biomarkers. We need biomarkers. There is, if you don't know how to measure the effectiveness of the drug, you're never going to find it. Otherwise, it's like, you know, hitting the throwing the dart and hoping that it's going to hit the bullseye. I mean, like, that's what has been happening. We need biomarker. I mean, look up in the history. There's like, without biomarkers, there is no way to actually come up with a, you know, solution. So what we are working on is digital biomarker, because that's the fastest way to get, because the brain, you can't biopsy it. You can't, you know, you don't know, but the brain is actually putting out a lot of physiological information on, you know, how you move, how you talk, how you sleep, how your eyes are moving, how your facial is moving. And we, we can analyze all of those physiological data. That's like massive amount of data that the brain is putting out. And, uh, you know, that is a great opportunity to figure out the progression tracking, a prognosis, and also diagnosis. Services like 23andMe, I know they don't do, you know, whole genome sequencing, but is there anything that they have data on that you could piggyback on for a start? No, it's very, very high level. 23andMe is a very high level data set that it's not really, you can't uh, really, it's not, doesn't have the granularity to really figure out the, what we need for ALS. Oh, I just wonder since the they have so many millions of, uh, you know, they've analyzed so many millions of people, but even at a, you know, very surface level, perhaps if you were able to see, you know, how many of that cohort also had ALS, Maybe there would be something even in that, you know, that simple analysis that jumps out. People have looked at it, might be, but my, I mean, you know, we, we haven't, uh, we want to talk to 23andMe if they'll actually share the data with us, but we haven't really reached out. And uh, I know somebody who actually worked with me at WebMD, who's a VP there and wanting to reach out, but just that, you know, from the experts in ALS who are genomics, they, they haven't been, you know, up, jumping up and down with excitement to actually say that they're going to find something because we need to find with the whole genome sequencing and also where we are with answer ALS is like transcriptomics data and proteomic data that is, you know, go down the list of, you know, what happens, you know, you have whole genome sequencing and then you have, you know, uh, transcriptomics, proteomics, like uh, RNA-seq, right? Like we need all of those things to really figure out and study the details. Is there anyone that has a, a big database maybe like the Human Microbiome Project. Is there anyone that has a big database of genome-wide sequencing that maybe you could, you know, speak to them and say, hey, the subset of your database that also ended up with ALS, if you track them longitudinally, you know, we'd like that and we'll pay you because you already have the data, let's say. I think, I think it's been done. I mean, there, there is some analysis has been done. Um, because we don't have the clinical data associated with it, it's hard so what we need is you need to do the whole genome sequence of these patients and also clinical data associated with it. That is, how are they progressing? If there is limb or if there is bulbar or would they, the date of diagnosis, how, you know, like you need to know clinical data on top of it. I'm trying to help you solve the problem on this call, but it doesn't look like I'm able to do that it. I'm not sorry. Gonna happen. <laughs> Unfortunately, I spent a lot of years on it thinking that I'm going to save my husband too. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry about this, Indu. I know it sounds like a terrible situation, but at least you're trying to do something about it. How can people find out more about your work and help participate in whatever way they wish to? You know, if they can go to everything, ALS.org slash research, uh, people can get involved. Uh, people with ALS, people 
who don't have ALS, people who have families who've had ALS, because that is very important because there is an inheritability factor if somebody has had an ALS in their family. And not only ALS, if any neurological conditions, because if that Parkinson's might be, somebody else will get ALS because it's all related. They're all cousins, you know, FTD, Alzheimer's. So we, we really encourage anybody who have had you know, anybody in their family with neurology, neurological issue to get involved, be active, be, you know, even 10 minutes a week, every two weeks will go a long way to help these patients and to really move this whole field forward. Like I said, we're about 40 to 50 years behind AL, I mean, behind cancer. And it's like today we're finding it, think of it as a cancer, finding it at stage four and hoping that we're gonna solve this. And we need to find it at stage zero and stage one. And that means we would love for everybody to get involved. Anybody can get involved because we were looking at also people with no neurological issue as controls. So we study them, their longitudinal data, and how is it different with people with ALS? So so people can get involved, everythingals.org slash research. Well, very good. Indu, thank you for coming. And I know it's an extremely personal story for you, but thank you for sharing and for doing what you do. I appreciate you being here. Thank you, Richard. I really appreciate you inviting me to be on your podcast. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.